Good evening and welcome once again to share some insights from the Bible. I want to talk about the phrase, the kingdom of God, this evening. Uh, I've been fascinated with that phrase for a long, long time, as I told you in our introduction earlier. So tonight I want to I want to look at the question I'm not sure I can answer it but I want to at least look at it what is the kingdom of god First of all <clears throat> the question comes is Israel the kingdom of god much of the old testament is a history of god's people the israelites we know that it began with the call of Abraham and continues through Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, the fathers of the Jewish religion, the patriarchs, we call them. We read of Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, who was sold by his jealous brothers into slavery in Egypt. And he was there for some time. And he rose actually to leadership in Egypt and became actually a, a savior for his family, for Israel, if you will, because he was in charge of distributing food during this great famine. You, you know the story, I believe. So after 400 years in Egyptian captivity, Remember that, uh, that uh, Jacob and his sons came to Egypt and uh, Joseph found them a place to live, cared for them, they were fed. But they stayed there for 400 years and became slaves to the Egyptians. And you know the story of Moses and how God called Moses to lead his people out of bondage in Egypt. One of the things in Exodus 19.6, God told his people after they had come out of Egypt, we don't have time to go into the plagues and crossing the Red Sea and God destroying the Egyptian army. But after they had escaped that, in the 19th chapter of Exodus, God told Moses to tell the people, now here's the important thing I want you to notice. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And so God says in the beginning, right after the nation of Israel was formed, you shall be a kingdom of priests. So from that point on, we have kind of a sense of the kingdom. I believe that the phrase kingdom of priests describes what God really would have liked Israel to become. Priest. Priest is a uh, intermediary between God and man. Uh, God's plan was that Israel should be uh, the light to the nations, the ones who would take his love to the rest of the world. Perhaps they failed at that, but they, from that point on, they considered themselves a kingdom. Now, it was another 400 years after the period we call the period of the judges. This is a period when uh, God would raise up a temporary leader who would rescue the people from oppression and, and uh, I guess we call it terrorism today, and uh, maybe they would rule for a while. But there was no king over Israel. There was these temporary judges, they called them, that God would raise up. But after 400 years, the people decided they wanted a king. All the other kingdoms of the world had kings. They wanted a king. Finally, God chose 
a man by the name of Saul, you know the story. King Saul proved to be a failure. Look with me at 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. Samuel said to Saul, You've acted foolishly. You haven't kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man, here it is again, a man after his own heart. There's that authenticity we talk about. And the Lord has appointed him a ruler of his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. God will allow them to have a king, but he wanted a king who had a heart for God. Now we remember then how David became king and ruled Israel, and he truly was a man after God's own heart. Under the rule of David, Israel reached its peak as a kingdom. It was a period that was always remembered and looked back on as the I started to say the good old days, but the days when Israel was at its peak. And they always looked for a return to that. During the reign of David, we read the covenant God made with David. Now, this is important in the history of Israel, in our understanding of the Jewish nation. We call it the Davidic covenant. And it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's read it. God said to David, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I'll correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not be depart from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. God promised David that his throne should always exist. Now we know that during the time of the captivity, God kept his word. He said, I will correct him with a rod of men. But we also know that that son of David, Messiah ben David, Messiah the son of David, has yet to come back and he will rule forever. And so maybe in a sense there is a kingdom there. Now we read of the kings in the Old Testament in uh, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, we read about the division of the northern, northern kingdom. The ten tribes went to the northern kingdom. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed to the south in Jerusalem. The kingdom of Judah and the throne of David stayed in Judah. And until the end of Judah as a nation, there was a descendant of David on the throne. We read about them. Because God had promised a king forever, the Jewish people have always and still are looking for that anointed king, anointed Messiah, Messiah the king, to restore the kingdom of David to its original power and glory. We know that that promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Now, remember when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 6? 
So when they had come together, they were asking him, now look at this question, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? You see, even after all the teachings of Jesus, after all the discipleship and all the teachings about the kingdom, they were still looking for a restored kingdom. They were all looking back to making Israel great again. You get that? <laughs> so, so in the minds of Jesus' followers, the kingdom of God was a restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Now, there's a reason for that. When Jesus came talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, uh, they knew about the kingdom of heaven. They had read the prophets of the Old Testament. Let's look at a couple of those prophecies. Isaiah 9, one of the, oh, one of the most well-known prophets and prophecies. There will be no end to the increase of his government of peace on the throne of David and on his kingdom to establish and uphold it with judgment, justice and righteousness from then on and forever. The seal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then David, Daniel rather, 244. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And then again in Daniel chapter 4, verse 3. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. The kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and is dominion from generation to generation. Then another from one of the minor prophets, Obadiah 1, verse 2. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Now, there's no question in my mind that when the kingdom of God is complete and fully honored, that Israel will play a vital role. If you believe the word of God, how could you think otherwise? But does that really define the kingdom of God? Does that answer the question, what is the kingdom of God? The second question I ask myself, is it even an earthly kingdom? We come to the New Testament, which is full of the phrase, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They don't even appear that way as the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God at all in the Old Testament. So we'll be spending most of our time discussing the kingdom now from now on in the New Testament. The Jewish people, I've said, are looking for a restoration of the Davidic kingdom. But remember at the end of Jesus' life when he was standing before Pilate on trial, he said in John 18, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So Jesus said, my kingdom is not of, the, it's not an earthly kingdom. It's not a kingdom of this world. Now, again, while I believe that God's kingdom will be and is present and manifest in this world, I don't believe this defines what the kingdom of God really is. So let me try to define the kingdom of God. Earthly kingdoms are defined geographically. We talk about the British Empire, and right away we think the British Islands and uh, its possessions around the world. We talk about uh, the United States, and we think about uh, the geographic boundaries and uh, it and its possessions. So if you were a Jew, and 
were born as citizens of the kingdom of Israel, you consider yourself a part of that kingdom of Israel. I was born in the United States, so I'm a citizen of the United States. Or in some cases, other people, we're reading a lot about that these days, might become citizens by immigration. In Judaism, it was by becoming a proselyte, being baptized into the Jewish faith. But remember, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And Paul, writing to the Romans, I think this is, this is very, very important. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He said it's not eating and drinking. In other words, it's not a physical kingdom. You can't define it by food and possessions and houses and lands. What he says, it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. One of the things that strikes me as I read that is the word righteous. When I think righteousness before I begin to study it, I think of right conduct. I think of moral law, keeping the, keeping the laws, keeping the, uh, the moral code, doing everything Jesus said to do. I want to discuss that more as we go on later, talking about the people of the kingdom. Righteousness describes a right relationship with God. That's more than doing. And again, I, I've mentioned before, it's a relationship of the spirit, of the heart. In Jesus' day, there were two groups of people that he often addressed. We find it over and over in the New Testament. They were the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were men who studied the Word of God, the law, the teachings, tried to interpret it and tried to uh, put it in the context so that everybody could do it. The Pharisees was a group of men who lived their life trying to obey those laws. And in, in, in their context, they came up with hundreds of laws that were not part of the original scriptures, but laws that kind of, we say, build a hedge around the laws. For example, the law said, Thou shalt not take the Lord name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, they took this to such extremes of taking the Lord their God in vain. And I had my own definitions for that. But they took it to such extremes that they would not even say the word Yahweh. They substituted words. Sometimes they just used the word name, uh, Hashem. Uh, and today, in strict Jewish uh, context, uh, they will not even type the word God. They'll, they'll type G underscore D. And that's part of this building a hedge, doing everything in their power to keep from breaking the laws of God. But here's my point. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is kind of the Magna Carta of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 20, for I say to you, unless your righteousness, there's that word again, exceeds that, surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, it's not keeping the letter of the law. If anybody ever did that, it would be the Pharisees. In fact, someone has said, and I believe it so, that Jesus was probably more like the Pharisees and keeping uh, 
the written law, not the Pharisaic law. So righteousness is more than keeping the law. It's a relationship of the heart. I think one of our modern writers, I think it was William Barclay, said that rather than a kingdom be, being defined by its borders, this kingdom is a kingdom defined by its king. It's a people whose king is truly God, who reigns totally, not only in our conduct, but in our affections, our hearts, and our minds. Uh, it's so much more. Yeah, we have to be born into that kingdom. We know that. Jesus said you must be born again. But it's more than that. It's more than a trip to the altar or bowing down and confessing our sins and claiming by faith that which he's provided for us. It's the beginning of a new life. I get this devoted to him where he is the center. He is the king. He is the Lord. So our next lesson, we're going to be talking about who is the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about some of the teachings Jesus said about the people that are in the kingdom of God. Who is the kingdom of God? One last thought today. Matthew tells us two things. One of them, now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. And later in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? I think it means that when those people and when we people make Jesus Christ the center of their lives and affections and priorities, that we become citizens of the kingdom and understand what Paul said, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy. Don't forget the peace and joy that goes with it. In the same way, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's available. All we have to do is accept it, claim it, repent. When Jesus becomes king of our lives, we become citizens of the kingdom. That's how I define kingdom, by its citizens and the King. Thank you again for joining us for this lesson on the Kingdom.